All right, we are here on the CMC podcast with Wayne Leroy, John McKentley joining us this time, and me, Kelly Byrne. We are uh, talking about is the belay competency drop test and whistle test still a valid test method or rigging uh, paradigm. So there's been lots of uh, talk and debate on it. There's been multiple uh, competing presentations at the International Technical Rescue Symposium. Um, for those who uh, might need a refresher, uh, the belay competency drop test is a 200 kilogram mass falling one meter under three meters of rope with no more than a meter slipping through the device. And the maximum arresting force uh, felt on the anchor should be uh, no more than 15 kilonewtons. And that's now an ASTM standard. I think it's ASTM 2436. Uh, Yeah, okay. Uh, So that's, I mean, it's supposed to be representative of a fall onto a second line, you know, from your main line during an edge transition. Is that everybody's understanding of it or anybody ever hear it a different way? But basically, edge transition gone wrong, right? That's kind of the that's that's what it was. Supposedly the worst case scenario. Yeah, and and, and actually, there would be um, right here in Arner's paper from 1990. Um, I thought it was 89, from, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> actually, actually, it was 1990, and the only reason I know that is I dug through my files. Um, and um, it was from the British Columbia Council of Technical Rescue. So, yeah. Uh, was that just the piece of paper you had laying around? Or did you, like, is that the findable online, do you think? Um, good Lord. I have no idea. I got this from Arner and so did John in person. Oh, no um, kidding. Oh, yeah. Back when, you know, we were, back when John was still weaving rope out of, vines and things like that yeah 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 Yeah. no that's uh so that was that a nader's presentation which was pre-iters was that what that was from i think the original john correct me if i'm wrong was in the it was in the 80s the one that i've got a copy of is in the 90s okay um the original this is from august of 90 was arner's paper so that would have been nader's world yeah, that was definitely the Nader's time frame. Um, well, it was actually the transition time. Yeah. yeah. Oh, no, I, I take it back. Sorry. No, that was definitely the Nader's time frame. And I had um, I had something from 89, which is why I said that, but it was probably exactly the same. And just, you know, where it went out and, and depending on the timing, you know, when it got presented and all that. Yeah, I think the one that you're referencing is the one, the testing from Sedona in 89. Um, no, actually, what I was thinking of was something else, but still, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. I thought the testing from – the testing of Sedona with John Dill and Arner and Reed and all them, I thought was even after that. But Really? I, I don't I have did, a copy of it, so. No, I didn't. Me. The first ones were, according to the paper, were Denver, I'm guessing Estes Park, in 87 and then Sedona in, um, spring of 89. Okay. All right. Boy, I, I'd done some looking earlier. I couldn't find it. I thought that I was looking for that, that very, uh, that very I'll test. Send, so, I'll send you a copy if you want it. Yeah, totally. Absolutely. So did that, uh, did that precede, uh, John Dills? Are you really on belay or was that, was that his answer to, or, or was that a, a part of that whole testing procedure? Uh, anybody know that? Like, I, I remember hearing about that paper and reading about it, but it's been, you know, probably 10 years since I've looked at it. Do you, anybody, John, do you know that answer? I don't know the answer. I'm trying to find it. <laughs> I gotcha. Which, interesting resource uh, for, for those of you in uh, listening land. You know, um, you know, John's been around since, for quite some time, and I know Leroy's got a box of uh, all of his Eiders folders. Uh as do I, they're up in my closet, but they they don't go back uh, nearly as far, I don't think. Uh, Leroy, how far back does your uh, uh, personal database go there, Leroy? My Nader's file? Yeah, yeah. Back to uh, mid-80s. Oh, really? Okay, Psh, man. That's unbelievable. Like, and that's, uh, you should uh, scan that and make copies for the world, because, like, if you have a flood, we're, we're going to lose them all, you know? So <laughs> well, I you have, know what? Uh, well, have... you know what? 
what's really hard is moving all the stones. Yeah, yeah, right. The tablets. <laughs> well, the 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 unfortunate thing is back in those days, you know, since then with uh Eiders, you know, we 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 asked permission and wanted to put them all online and had some sort of an electronic database where people can access them. But back in the Nader's days, it only it really only went back five or six years, a few years ago, because it was so difficult chasing the people down and finding permission and everything like that. And so certainly back in the eighties, none of that stuff exists out there unless somebody has posted it and for another reason. Wow. Or referred to it in something else, and you can find it. But it, it's difficult to find those things now. S- seems like a bit of, uh, you know, that's a, a pretty hefty amount of institutional knowledge that's just uh, hiding in, you know, uh, banker's boxes in the basement, you know? Uh, if, uh, I wonder what it would take to get those out to the general public. That'd be kind of cool to, hey, uh, the, to, to do. I don't, have a, I don't have a problem scanning and posting and doing whatever. Sure. Well, I, I mean... I mean, I'll dig up what I've got. I've only got like four filing cabinets full of things. So. Yeah, sure. It's, it's like nothing. Just take you a couple of uh, years that we all have uh, in reserve, right? Yeah, you're yeah prob- exactly. Yeah. Yours is probably more organized than mine is. And, and, and I know yours goes back further. I don't think mine goes back. There might be something uh, from the 80s, but not not from originally – you know, getting it, you know, got it from somebody from somebody. But well, the big issue um, is, again, um, kind of back to what you were talking about is it's all good ancient history. But, you know, is it something we still want to pay attention to? And and then permissions on those things aren't or pretty much disappeared from the ro- rescue world anyway. I guess uh, he won't see if it's published or not then. But the uh... well, somebody will rat us out. You know. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, sh- I'm, sh- I'm sure of it. But uh <laughs> Now, even if you don't pay attention, like even if it was not uh, relevant to what's going on now, it'd be a neat uh, history path, I think, for people to be able to to trace. You know, if uh, you know, we're all students of the game, and I think if we to go back and look at where we were and you know where we are now is, is that would be a that'd be kind of cool. And you know, a lot of stuff like the you know the twin tension stuff, which is going to come into this belay competency here in a second, is pretty neat i was looking through an old book i had which is like a compilation of other papers by a guy who used to run a training group out of pennsylvania he would just you know put a bunch of stuff together but i mean twin tension stuff was in there you know two ropes through a a single rack or you know running Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know uh, a rope through a rack with prussics in front of it you know that the twin tension is is nothing new i think people saw the benefits of it it's just been recently we've had a device that can you know act as a a friction device for a lower and for a raise as well as a as a competent belay that, that we kind of i guess it's kind of come back around is that the general gist of how you guys would feel actually yeah. um yes. yeah uh john i know you were there um if you would remember this was nader's would have been 88 87 88 where the um guy from San Diego, San Diego lifeguards got vilified um, for doing their twin tension. Well, we would refer to it as twin tension now um, <clears throat> on the way they did rescues on the uh, ocean front. Mm-hmm. So what's old is new again, or <laughs> it, it, it ain't different. No. Everything comes full circle. Yep. Yeah, it, it absolutely does. So, you know, the, the belay competency test pretty much assumes, you know, nobody's touching the device, right? You know, uh, it, it's really just a look at whether it can arrest the load, uh, you know, when it falls the prescribed distance. But, you know, how do you, how do you have a good test to test something where you have to let go of it to make it work, you know, like the MPD letting go of the handle, you know, the ID, uh, you would have to let go of the handle. And, you know, if you went to a, with that, if you went to a two person load, you would still need the secondary friction carabiner, which you don't use generally when it's, uh, you know, when you're sharing the load, like, is there a way to, uh, account for people, not just the device, I guess, or a human interaction with that, uh, belay test 
And he, well, I, I think if you look at it in general and everything, I mean, aviation, everything, right? The human factor is always the unknown, and it's something you really can't uh, you can't test for, which is why all these things appear to be non-human because the human factor is so variable. Sure. The, well, then one, one of the things that you've said there, and, and you know, as far as uh, well, an ID running the rope through a, a carabiner and then having to hold on to it probably doesn't always work. But I've kind of always advocated if you're going to be using the MPD, you know, we've all seen the videos, Tom Pendley and others, where the guys forget to let go because they're trying to hold on to it and they physically can't as that load accelerates. And I've always said, you know, Put the device out of line a little bit so it almost rips it out of your hand and has to sure uh, you have to let go because so often the people want to hold on to the load and can't and then they you know they override the safety of the device and in some cases you can't do it but that was the reason for that you know and that goes back to the eiders arguments from you know uh the early 90s with uh using a, a lowering device or something like that as, as a, you know, using a figure eight or a mantra hitch or whatever um, that required hand friction. And I can remember one of the, an ASTM meeting with um, Arner Larson and some of them when we were talking in Kirk Mothner's discussions at, at Nader's and then Eiders about having to use an artificial hand because some we were so afraid somebody would grab onto the rope and actually be able to hold it and rip their hands through the device. And, <laughs> right. We, I, I made one kind of artificial hand and Kirk made another, and those were kind of floating around for a while. I think there's one in an ASTM standard even. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty interesting. That's uh, probably interesting backstory on that, like just two plates clamping uh, with spring pressure or something. Yeah, the the one I did was, uh, you know, parallel plates exactly. I had springs underneath wing nuts and two parallel plates, and the rope went down the middle, and you could, uh, you could adjust, you know, how tight the springs were. <laughs> Uh, Kirk's was more of a two spring place, but a single spring and the rope went around and did, did kind of a 180 around, uh, around yeah. the spring. Yeah. Nice. Now, uh, wing nuts on rope. That's a totally appropriate for a belay test, I suppose. The, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I pulled a quote from a, a Douglas Adams book, you know, a, a common mistake that people make when trying to design something completely foolproof is to under eight the underestimate the ingenuity of complete fools. And I think that's a, you know, I, I think with all of the, the systems, like you're just not, it's going to be really difficult to engineer the human factor out of it. And I, I think. Yeah. And for it to be repeatable, right. I mean, you, you can't replicate a person. You, you can't. And you know, that's, you know, a, a bunch of years ago, I'd written something on my website about that, you know, how, how do you apply an equal rule about not letting go to a device during a belay event? Like you could, you can make any belay device fail if you, you know, put the right person in there. And if you give me your belay device, I guarantee I can fail it. Like, you know, mm -hmm. on purpose, of course. So I, I don't know that there is a way uh, to, to, to do that, to account for the human factor other than just, you know, consistent training. Um, but it brings like, is the is the belay competency drop test the best is that the is that the best most real world test like how many would we be better off having a test while we're over the edge you know with a load already uh, in movement rather than a you know a slack belay during edge transition do you, i mean do you guys no, see a, a better place for no it? i i personally i think that we all know that the biggest risk takes place at the edge right yep. the edge transition is the highest risk event Fair enough. Yeah, I mean, if you have now, a rigging whether, problem, that's when it's going to occur. If that's when it's yeah. going to rear its face the second that system becomes loaded. And I and I don't care if it goes. I don't care if the load is coming in or if the load is coming out. Okay. We all know if right when Kelly, when's when's the last time you saw a vortex or whatever tip over on the way in or on the way out? So I I have. Uh... Me, I had one going on the way in, like, and that that was my fault. But the, like, I I was the goofball on the rope. But it was at the edge. It was never, mm -hmm. you know, it, it was not while I was free hanging. Uh, what about you? Well, same thing. It was yeah. actually coming in because everybody's OCD on the way out. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, I mean the edge transition is a, uh, 
uh, you know, is a big part of it. I mean, twin tension on arrays like that, you're not going to get any drop on that. But uh, no, I, you know, I don't disagree. I was just throwing it out there. John, what are your thoughts? Well, I was, I was thinking that, you know, and on the rays, um, the twin tension is so much easier to maintain. So if you do have your high directional tip or something like that, it's probably less of a big deal because the the ropes are going to be tensioned or, you know, more easily tensioned than they are the other way around. But, um, sure. go, you know, obviously I think that going out, going down or making the edge transition and probably going down because you have the likelihood of it's the first time the system has been loaded probably. So yeah. if some, if there was something wrong with it, it's going to show up there once the load is over the edge or the, the, you know, even if it was coming from the bottom and you were hauling it up, it's it's less likely to show up in, instead of that transition. And especially where you have the possibility of, you know, one rope being slack and then a surge going on the other rope, which is, of course, the whole theory behind the belay competency. Sure. Um, cool. I guess in that, <laughs> bringing the vortex into it and uh, it just as a, a thought for another show, like, you know, do we put it high through the vortex or, or not, or uh, temporarily or not? Like that's, there's always a good debate for that. I think uh, I definitely have my, uh, my feelings on that, but uh I, th I think that I think we could do it. I think we will do a whole other show on that one. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, t -t -t so I guess, so how about the whistle test? You know, we use the whistle test as a, you know, a rigging paradigm, how to rig, uh, you know, if, if somebody blew a whistle and everybody let, uh, put their hands up, uh, the load would not drop to the ground is, is, I mean, that, that seems pretty, I don't know if antiquated is the right word. I mean, it's a good thought, but I think with the modern equipment, uh, ID clutch, MPD, what have you like that, that's, that's pretty much, does anybody really still have to account for that anymore? Like, I guess we do, but you know, uh, with all I, think, stuff, I think right? it's just Kids a way to have. illustrate the hands-free non-human intervention thing. You know, I got by saying the whistle test and everybody lets go that way, the device is totally on its own and, you know, you're not really using it, but it, it's just a way to get, it's kind of a, a little more of a graphic example of nobody's touching the ropes, nobody's holding on because it's really easy to see that uh, friction device belay, you know, in, in most cases, we'll say the muncher hitch, um, obviously it's not going to work if you're not holding on to it and, and that makes it graphic. The thing I'm concerned about is some people don't get the word. And I know we've always been very careful about talking about it. When we talk about the whistle test is like, hey, guys, it's a conceptual deal. But I'm amazed when I hear people think that you really do this. And it's like, no, that isn't really one of those deals where in the middle of the operation, just for kicks and giggles, we're going to blow a whistle and see what happens when everybody <laughs> lets go. But I've had people that take it that way. And, uh, <laughs> really wow yeah I know. it amazes me but it's kind of like i want to i go out of my way to explain it because i i should probably go back and find it but i've really seen it written that way and you just want to shake your head but whatever <laughs> <laughs> yeah no uh so i guess is is there a corresponding test for what happens when you don't let go <laughs> like that's uh because i was always you know uh, and and i, I got a sec a follow-up question to that but you know it, again i think it comes back to that human interaction like you know the test if you do let go it's it's so everybody you know feels safe on their system i suppose but you know what happens if you don't let go what happens if uh failure one occurs and then somebody doesn't let go um i, I don't think there i i have not been able to think of an adequate test for that so it's it's just always been a curiosity to me um but where was that going? Oh, actually, actually, Kelly, you know, yeah. <clears throat> to tie into that a little bit, I, I guess I kind of thinking and looking at the uh, twin tension thing, right? Right. Is um, if one line fails, is it still controllable? That's where I kind of go to. Uh, is, can, so, okay, yeah. so you're descending. Yep. Right. We're lowering and we all know that forces are lower when you're lowering than when you're raising. Mm 
Right. But one line fails. Yep. Make it up. Doesn't matter. Sure. <clears throat> is it is it still a controllable event on the way down? On the way up, it's a given. We all know it's not going anywhere. Right. Yep. Agree. Right. And to me, that that's kind of an interesting concept. Is is it a controllable event as opposed to a drop test? If you if you kind of know where I'm going, I, I do, and it ties into this uh, other point I, I I had here, which. And it really, like, it's no, uh, if anybody knows me, it's not a secret that I'm a Twin Tension uh, uh, fan boy. But uh, when we look at other rescue systems, or just analyzing systems, we ne- we don't account for a second point of failure. You know, like, uh, if the first rope is cut, you know, what happens if the first rope fails and the operator doesn't let go of the second one? Like, that, I don't, we don't apply that to any other metric in our uh, rope systems you know which we don't we don't ever add a second point of failure and the i guess the the flaw in that uh, is that you know what if failure one causes failure two which is you know the the controllable load like you're talking about leroy so i i I, uh i don't know because i i used to get real bent out of shape at first you know i'd say it's 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 fine if we fail one line the second one will catch it you know but you know what if the second one doesn't catch it because the guy holds the handle open or whatever like well, fuck. What else? What else do we apply that to? You know, nothing. But uh, I think I was just uh, being a little uh, too stubborn in my beliefs. Uh, <laughs> and well, you could uh, have some sort of cascading event like that, and it'd turn catastrophic. Obviously, there's, you, you know, most of the time is only, you know, you got two ropes, and if it's a vertical situation, yeah, the first rope fails, and something happens to the second rope, and that was one of the reasons why um, Kirk Mothner and others were advocating twin tension ropes because the the, the potential for damage by going from 50% of the load, you know, theoretical, yep. to, to 100% was only half as big of a deal as going from zero to 100. And, um, you know, the testing he did over steel beams, and you can imagine in other places, just even on an anchor, sure. that... Um, that was that was the reason that was one of the big reasons for for twin tension yeah uh, definitely and for those uh listening if you're if you're interested in finding out uh, more about these papers we're talking about there's a couple of them uh geez kirk mothner on the eiders website itrsonline.org did some edge tests in 2014 uh rigging for rescue had their two tension two two tension or not to tension which is it's on their website that was 2019 russ mcculler did t- two presentations one in 2015 and one in 2017 uh tom penley d- has had a couple articles and some as far back as 2010 with like tan and prussic belays and then also he did some uh, uh testing with twin tensions with i think mpds and then also with uh, asaps as well yeah, he uh, did. And, yeah, and he did. Uh, yeah, M, M, yeah, MPD just uh, flat out belay testing. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, I was r- reading uh, the other day in preparation for this. The Russ McCuller, M C C U L L A R, his uh, 2017 Eiders paper, uh, an analysis of the modern day belay, competent belay or competent belayer. Um, and while I think he and I d- aren't. 100% agreement on uh, what the best belay method is. I think I agree 100% with them about, you know, competent belayers and, and good training are, are probably the more important than anything else in the whole chain of events there. Um, well, that's th- definitely true. And in, in, in one of Tom Penley's tests in Arizona, that was exactly it. He took novices that weren't familiar with the devices and really didn't know what they were doing in most cases, I think. I think he did that on purpose. Sure. Was to test the devices with people that didn't know how to do it. And we still you still see issues if you don't know how to how to do things. But um you know, we, we had one the other day at, at, on a call that I was on, but you know, it was no catastrophic big deal. But um you know, people that, that don't adequately tra- train with the devices. And so that was, you know, part of Russ's thing. But you can't, and, and probably for the listeners, um, all these things should be, should have a caution in front of these articles and presentation in as much as that there are biases in some cases. 
and they're not peer reviewed. And it's kind of like we say at Eiders every year. It's like, try this on your own. It's reason for thought, but don't take everything you read as is the absolute truth without really looking into it because there are some flaws and some testings and things we've seen over the years. Uh, most definitely. There's there's a lot of biases in there, and it's, you know, on the, the inside baseball side of things, you know, once you know the players and are reading their papers, you're like, oh, I know exactly what this – what angle they're angling for. Sure. Uh, but – For the listeners, we're all smiling at each other right now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> You know, I mean, and, and well, and my thing is, is I always ask guys in class and I ask my guys when I was still on the job, where do you want your best guy as far as skill set is? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's got to be the belay man. It, he, he has to be. But it's usually guy, not that. <laughs> no, no, it's he's not. Normally, yeah, he's normally the guy that's hanging over the edge or he's sure. running the show. Right. And you, and you kind of go, wait a minute, that's a waste of skill right there. Yeah, it it, it absolutely is. And that's well, uh, well, I think that's probably one of the reasons why the gear is so strong and all these things, because let's face it, lowest common denominator is the person, not the gear. Right. True. We would yeah. like yeah. to all think that everybody's really well trained, but it's simply not the truth. I mean, OK, so a guy took a class. How long ago did he take it? Who did he take it from? What were that instructor's beliefs? I mean, this goes back to why the gear is the way it is. Yeah, absolutely. You know, the, the factor of ignorance, right? Like that's, uh, yep. I think it, we're, we're trying to account for that. So w- with that, you know, I know, um, you know, there, there's without being too, I guess it's a little CMC centric cause this is a CMC podcast, but you know, when the clutch came out and the, the, the YouTube marketing video associated with it, they showed four different ways of using it. I think it was four. So I'll, I'll spit out the four and then we can uh, talk about them. Uh, two separate operators on two separate anchors. Uh, so one guy on anchor one with a clutch, person on anchor two with the clutch. Then we had two operators, you know, each with their own clutch and one person tailing their rope uh, for them. Uh, one operator you know, operating both clutches, still having the slack rope in his hand. But uh, and one person tailing, and then uh, one operator with an ASAP on each line. So you know that's definitely, you know, we're trading equipment for manpower. But you know, I, I always put those to like to my guys at work. Which, which one of those is the safest? You know, that it it would. I don't know. Like, I guess we, we got to figure out what we're accounting for. I'm going to spit out my thought. I think one operator with an ASAP on each is the safest. Like you're not going to outsmart a uh, an inanimate object you know we've taken that's i think gone the farthest for taking a human out of the uh out of the equation you know that he's not thinking about what's for dinner or or uh you know answering his cell phone but uh hey, any, Kelly, any thoughts I, I on would, this for? or not thinking the other guy's doing it that, that's that's a very well I want, i'm gonna write that down i gotta get back to that but what were you about to say wayne sorry i was gonna say i i think um i, th- I think you're right in the sense that uh uh, one operator with ASAPs is the safest because you remove that human element. The concern I think that I've always had is, you know, the ASAP requires a certain speed to activate. Sure. Know? And this always seems to be brought up in the vertical environment. But think about a uh, a low angle environment or a steep angle environment in the wildland. Sure. There was an incident here in Arizona, right, where the guy fell and he was able to fall fast enough where the blair was able to keep up despite the fact that it took what I believe it was nine surgeries to fix his hands. Oh, geez. Right. So yeah, yeah, I've always wondered, can a guy fall just fast enough to not trigger the ASAPs at the same time, suffer some pretty egregious injuries? Uh, I think, I think the answer is probably yes. uh, Especially given that, you know, that you know of one that happened. My, my, my counter argument to that one is, you know, the, uh, like the meme, you know, but did you die? You know, which is not a good, uh, not no, a real good m- yeah. metric for, for and, and, it, to, but. and just to clear it up for the, for the listeners, the fall was not ASAP related. It was tandem project belay rated. 
Oh, interesting. Yeah. interesting. That's even more but, interesting. Um, but again, you think about it, the guy's able to fall and the, the, the belayer is able to pay out enough rope to keep up with that speed. Sure. Yet there was some, some pretty significant injuries associated with that. No kid, boy. After my nine surgeries, I'd go find that guy and uh, show him how good my, my surgeries fixed me up, you know? Um, <laughs> Sounds so, like a communication. To, there's a no yelling, falling, or anything like that. Yeah. I mean, how is it that the belayer didn't know the rope was going out that fast? You know, <laughs> I mean, he must have been furiously pulling rope through those prussics. Uh, well, you I, know I, what it is? It's probably not pulling ropes through the prussics, Kelly. It's probably one of those ones where they're holding yeah. the prussics open and not right. using yep. the. You know what? Yeah, you know, I pulling bet you're the right. loop through because it wouldn't happen. Well, and and talking to Tom, he said that um, if I recall correctly, all he did is chalk them open. What uh, what do you mean? Held them in place. Oh, rope the peeled through. Okay. Yeah, I mean, yeah. If there's no bend of the rope coming into the prussic, you know, it's gonna it's it, you know stands a good possibility of sliding through. I suppose. Well, and if it has the, the back friction on it or whatever you want to call it, so that you have to really kind of pull the rope through, it wouldn't happen either. But yeah, you can uh, over back to the human error, Kelly. The first thing you said with the ASAP, you've eliminated the people screwing things up. Yeah, it's true, and I, I think uh, you know, I, I it's such an unqui- an equipment intensive uh, bit, you know, putting ASAPs on clutches or mpds or whatever but uh man, i think i received it... an email about this not too long ago from overseas yeah and uh the guy was concerned uh, about the use of the asap there and our reply from our engineers was the it's not the asap that's belay rated it's the clutch that's belay rated the asap is simply there to prevent you know an overspeed event if you will it's not it... an arresting device the clutch is the arresting device it it is. I mean, it just, it ends up slowing the rope so the clutch can uh, can do its job. Um, which I know when we did some uh, belay drops with like six hundred and sixty pound load, you know, catastrophic failure of the main line. You know, wide open on one of the handles, not even touching the slack rope. I mean, the the ASAP locked it up, and then the, you know, maybe one or two stitching deployed. You know, four kilonewton force on the anchor, kind of stuff. It was. I mean, for me, it was, it was super impressive. Catastrophic wise like that. Uh, I think that's an unbeatable combo, like, uh, you know, something that can stop the overspeed and then a device that'll, uh, you know, do all the heavy lifting on it. So, so Kelly, let me get back to what I was saying. So yes, I do believe that, that the two clutches, one operator ASAPs is by far the safest, um, having said that, how many rescue teams currently carry ASAPs? So one dev- it, one I do really like is the one operator holding both handles because you're getting true 50-50 with the tailor in position. Yeah. Because you have that second brain, right? Yep. Uh, I, I, I think you're right. I think that's a, uh, you know, pr- probably on an even plane with the, with the two ASAPs, you know, a backup uh, person holding, holding the ropes. And I know that's in uh, the... Oh, what is it? EMBC. What does that stand for? The emergency, the British Columbia emergency yeah. management. Yeah. Like on yeah. their paper that Mothner, Kirk Mothner did, you know, t- talks a fair amount about tailing the rope. So, uh, and all their tests were you know, pretty darn positive with it. So. Yeah. Um, the tailor, the tailor is essential in their, um, in their system and they're not using clutches they're using MPDs, but it's the same thing. It's, uh, having sure. the tailor there is that second point of, contact and it's easier to rig and cost you less money it, it absolutely does um and that's uh well we were doing belay tests uh, uh at work we ran two rope classes and every class we drop you know 400 pound loads on uh to our devices we were doing i think mpds on this one and uh you know even telling somebody you're gonna fail the rope like giving them the the heads up like i'm gonna fail a rope the, you know at least once a class one out of 16 students is like we're going for an excessive ride if, if we're not decking uh, altogether. And then we put a tailor on there and, you know, the forces are even on the anchors and, uh, you know, very, very little drop. It's a, it's a pretty slick solution if you got an extra person on, on scene to do it. Um, yeah, that's, that's – yeah, the, it, it's interesting that uh, when you look at it on the surface that – you know, one operator with you know two devices and two ASAPs is safer than, you know, potentially safer than uh, two separate operators. It just seems kind of counter and 
counterintuitive, maybe. I don't know if that's the right word. It, it is. The only thing that you have to consider is that you need to have that anchor that's totally, absolutely going to be bomb-proof because, I mean, there's ways, certainly ways to rig around it, but if you're going to have both of your devices um, together, they without a lot of rigging grief they've got you've got to have some big bomber anchor and in the british columbia examples it's no problem they have huge trees whereas sure. in my real world we don't always have that if we're going off a vehicle or we have a big tree no big thing but then there's sometimes when we have things that are less desirable and we don't want to have all our eggs on that one anchor and um, that's where it starts to get to be a little problematic with one operator and two devices yeah uh, m most definitely like they they that ain't happening if uh, if you got to use two separate trees, not not without a bunch of yoga, I guess. But yeah, maybe you can make it work. Um, well, one thing I want to circle back around to, John, you you had uh, mentioned, uh, you know, people worrying about the, you know, the other guys doing it, you know, like the other guys uh, handling the load. And I, I know when I when I teach it, I think uh, an interesting distinction, R rather than like, hey, we're both lowering, it's it's definitely a mindset shift that you are the other guys backup so i mean it f functionally doesn't change anything you're still both lowering somebody but you know in the back of your mind you have to be thinking like i am fully anticipating that that guy's going to screw it up uh, and depending on who the operator is it's really not that hard sometimes but the uh... well don't even don't <laughs> even put the person in there just say something's going to happen to their anchor or some part of their system and the, sure you know if you, you can leave the personalities out and it's the same thing yeah, they still have fun. to be back remember they're backing it up <laughs> No, that's that's very true. I thought, but uh, yeah, operating with that mindset that like, man, I am definitely the backup, even though you're still lowering. It has, uh, uh, I, th I think it's helped out a bit uh, from new operators. Mm -hmm. So, uh, cool. Well, uh, wrapping it up, I think you know we're the the belay competency drop test is still you know I guess we're we're kind of uh, saying that it's it's not uh, outdated yet it's time has not come to to be gone yet uh you know it's still an adequate device test it's still a pretty violent uh, drop if anybody's ever seen it on video uh and it's accounting for a problem at the worst possible case you know at the edge transition right when the lines go from um loaded to or uh, unloaded to loaded like if, if something's going to go bad one it's going to be because the uh you know, you're right on the edge, uh, you know, and you're scared getting over the edge. And then two, you're, you're going to be proof loading your system initially. So I think that's, uh, I guess it's still a, a relevant test method. And then the whistle test, uh, you know, what happens, you know, what happens if everybody lets go? I think we agree that it's a, a, a better training, uh, device, you know, to, or, or mechanism for teaching people and, you know, not so much that you would actually blow a whistle to have everybody let go but uh i'm you know i'm still curious about how you uh you know what's the best test for for people you know i don't i don't think there is one like you know let them catch falling you know belay falling loads you know often because it happens maybe in training and probably not after that uh do any of you guys have like a an annual research for that or like on your teams or when you were on your teams or is that just like a, a training thing once in a while i know for us it's just once in a while you, you talk about belaying a falling load yeah yeah you know i was on a committee for the state of california several uh editions ago of nfpa uh mccantley was also with me um and we actually at that time nfpa required the drop okay and, and we actually had man what are we going to do we're going to have to get a whole separate cache of gear for people sure to drop this stuff onto. And then luckily uh, they updated the NFPA during that time and it allowed to have a hard unexpected, you know, yank on the rope suffice because it does go through a lot of equipment and a lot of departments can't um, afford to be dropping gear and putting gear out of service to satisfy that requirement. I mean, especially if you work for a large department. Sure. You know, that's uh, catastrophic. That's a lot of money. It is, but I, you know, you almost wonder if it's worth it. Like that's the most critical thing, you know. No, I agree. The, the 100%, consequence, yeah. But it, yeah, that that's hard to uh, justify dollars and cents wise. So, yeah, I think uh, in a I perfect do. world, I would agree with you. In a perfect world, it should be done. Sure. It's just that the real world that we all have to live in is like, well, 
it's kind of hard to justify to the bosses why I'm doing this and spending all this money. Yeah, <laughs> no doubt, especially if we're not having catastrophic mainline failures all the time, right. which yep. it's an, is another thing. I just don't think we're having that. No, it's amazing the effort that the community as a whole puts into this when these things aren't happening. Yeah, I, I mean, we, I think our efforts would be better directed, you know, elsewhere. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's 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 yeah, I just don't see it happening that often. So, is that all right? So, hey, Kelly. Yeah, yeah. Here's something for you. Okay. <clears throat> Could you do some research for me? <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> yeah. Sounds like a great artist <laughs> yeah, presentation. John, John knows <laughs> where I'm going. All right, what you where, got? When's the last time that there was a mainline failure? during a real operation as opposed to during training uh, like i will do i'll do that research but i imagine you already know what the answer is going to be and i think mm-hmm. I, I i don't know i can't i don't i've not i mean i'm pretty into it but i've not heard I'm, of one nope i'm throwing it out there for the listeners i yeah, do yeah. know and i'm not giving the answer okay, dagger. Right. you know that that's one of those um on the next podcast things. All right. All right, cool. That's, I mean, yeah, yeah, that, that would be awesome. I don't know that answer. Uh, if I had to guess, I'd say it was a uh, slack belay on an aerial ladder or something along the, no, I don't know. The, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, I, I mean, yeah, and not in training and then, and then to define failure, you know, like uh, yeah. tripods and vortexes and whatever's tipping over and everything like that. Oh, that I yeah, know. but yeah, you yeah. Know, th- we we know about some of those, and they've and they've been in training, and they've been in real operations. But um, is that is that really a failure um, in the sense that the line snapped and the total load went onto the belay or anything like that? You know. Yeah. No. Oh. Yeah. No. Actually, the only one of those I know, thinking back on it, was a a, a training high line in Peru where the the track line failed, and they only had a single line from up above, and. Yeah, attendant in the basket rider, you know, did a uh, pretty gnarly pendulum swing, but uh, yeah, we yeah we've seen the video. It was probably on that one, but then yeah. again, that wasn't a matter of a belay, so it didn't really make any difference there. Talking about belays, no, it really didn't. They 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 didn't even have a belay. So they, so Kelly, I I have heard uh, people say that yeah, we need to come up with something better other than the belay commonest drop test. I've heard no solutions, however. Yeah. Me neither. Right. Yeah. A lot of people say, hey, this needs to go away or this is antiquated. Okay. Sure. With what? What you yeah, got? And, yeah, the, and the it's, conversation it's, ends right there. It's been it been there for a long time and people can find little flaws with it. And we've been through things on it, you know, the flaking shelf arguments and and there's still people that fight it, but it's like, what's the alternative? And back to something you said earlier, we used to to do that on our rescue team, we used to do testing um and it, it, it really, it, because it was kind of violent, and this was before we had tandem pressics. And remember, we came from a climbing background, and this was body blaze, you know, before Grigri's and, you know, MPDs and tandem pressic blaze and all that, where we literally had the rope wrapped around us. And yeah. um, it was cruel and unusual punishment because <laughs> we, used to, we used to drop essentially – um, what would be kind of more considered a two person type of load. It wasn't exactly, it was 400 pounds. It wasn't exactly there. That's enough. But, uh, you know, we'd haul it up and drop it and, and you had to, you had to hold it and you had to get out of it. Ugh. And, um, you know, this is obviously almost 50 years ago when I used to sit there and go, this is stupid. And I'd see people with <laughs> rope burns on their backs and all kinds of violent things. And, it was like, well, this is silly. You know, why do why do we do this? Why don't we get ourselves out of the system? But it came from climbing where that was the belay in those days, you know, and that was when climbers were wrapping, you know, bowling on a coil around their chest for the belay and a lot of other things that hopefully were all past. But sure. we used to do it. And then it came down to the deal, like Wayne said, you know, we can afford to smoke a couple of Prusiks and recycle the same rope as a drop test. But we've just really gone away from doing it, you know? Sure. sure. No, absolutely. I, I'm, uh, I'm glad I never had to experience that, uh, <laughs> that side of it, but, uh, um, no, that, that's interesting. Like that's, uh, you know, Wayne, your, your, uh, thought on, you know, p- people, you know, grousing about it and then not having a solution kind of goes to that line, you know, that, uh, 
firefighters and rescuers by extension, you know, there's, there's two things we dislike, you know, the way things are and change. So I think that's, uh, <laughs> fits right into that, you know, like uh, this belay t- standard sucks. Like, all right, here's a new one. Ah, this one sucks even worse. You know, like, what do you, what do you do with that? So I don't know. It's, it's, it's interesting. Uh, it's interesting to me. I've been thinking about it for a bunch of years now. Like, is, is there a better test out there? You know, can you test people like you test equipment? I think the answer is probably no, but, uh, you know, at least, you know, your equipment's quality, whether your people are or not is, uh, just a matter of training. So I, I think that's, uh, as with everything else, you know, training is the key. So, uh, anybody have any closing thoughts or uh, issues I didn't cover with belay competency or, uh, this whistle test thought. Well, one one thing that you talked about and started with Wayne with writing something different for all yeah. of us and and certainly those of us on this panel that have been so involved in in testing and in standards writing and all sorts of things, it's 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 easy to complain about it and it's really hard to do. <laughs> and thinking of many many hours, Wayne talked about it with you know complying with a standard to try and set up a a, a training or testing program is difficult and writing those standards and trying to make everybody happy and make it real and repeatable and everything like that is very difficult. And, uh, I don't want to discourage anybody listening from getting in that. And I'm really hoping that we get some new brains in there looking at those things, uh, to do that, but it's a, it's a lot of work. It takes a lot of time. Yeah, no, no doubt. And I, that's, uh, I mean, I've uh, been uh, privy to see a little bit of it, uh, you know, in the back end. And, uh, yeah, it, that's uh, more work, uh, paperwork-wise, too, than uh, th- than what interests me. So, uh, but, I mean, there definitely has to be a, a next generation stepping up at some point. So, uh, you know, I, who knows? Maybe when I retire from the fire department, uh, I can uh, be uh, get a, as involved in standards as you uh, are and have been john like that's uh <laughs> you know you got your fingers in like all the standards don't you well kind of but um i'm phasing out we need new new people to do it you know some of us are running out of ideas and um uh, we base it it's the, the trouble is you need such a wide variety of experiences to write these things to to cover everybody be it for you know fire rescue or uh, other kinds of public safety rescue wilderness sure rope access or whatever you know no, uh, definitely. That's uh well, if you can hang on for four years and 25 days until I retire, maybe I can, uh, <laughs> I can help you out, but, uh, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, cool. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Leroy, any closing thoughts? Um, no, um, I don't think there's a great answer at this point. Yeah. I, I just don't. Um, we all look to that, um, thing whatever that thing is, right? Yep. <clears throat> whether it be an ASAP, whether it be two guys or whatever, it's like Wayne said, least common denominator. Um, we have to be smarter than our equipment. Yeah. Which in some cases, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, and being a truck guy for 20 plus years. Sure, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's a, uh, you know, sometimes force isn't the best option. Well, so weak mind and strong back usually works, but, uh, yeah. And, and rope rescue, <laughs> yeah, but, maybe not so much, but, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, yeah. <laughs> nope. You're, uh, no, I, I think you're right on that. Uh, Wayne, any, uh, any closing thoughts here? Nope. I kind of said my piece to you earlier, Kelly. Thanks. Right on. All right. Well, for, uh, John Leroy and Wayne, this is, uh, Kelly Byrne, uh, signing us off for, the uh, belay competency drop test and whistle test. We'll catch you on the next one. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.